guys. Shema here. Excited to be here. I am the founder and CEO of the Marketing Zen Group, and uh, I'm excited to be Youngree's Ask Me Anything today. So hopefully you guys are able to join us, and uh, you can ask any of the questions that you want, and I'm happy to to answer uh, best I can. So yeah, I was told to tell you guys a little bit about myself and what I'm doing, and uh, again, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to to answer the best I can, and uh, yeah, questions about really anything, entrepreneurship, marketing, technology, um, sort of a broad scope of things. So yeah, I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself and I'll answer some of the questions that have already come in. And um, again, if you guys are just joining and have questions, feel free to ask. So my name is Shema Hyder. I started the Marketing Zen Group when I was 23, right out of school. Um, it's a social media digital marketing um, agency. We do digital PR, social media, uh, influencer relations, um, all sorts of things. And it's been it's been a really fascinating journey so far. So started the company with just fifteen hundred dollars and uh, um, started the company myself. And we're now about thirty people, and we serve clients across the world. Everything from um, you know, from clients from Lithuania to Hong Kong to New York. So we work with a very global clientele and do some very neat stuff. Clients generally come to us when they're looking for, like, visibility and really getting known in their field. So that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. Along the way, I've ended up writing two books, uh, Momentum and uh, The Zen of Social Media Marketing. So um, social, The Zen of Social Media Marketing is going into its fourth edition, or I just went into its fourth edition, I should say, and Momentum just came out this past summer so they're both on social media and digital marketing so it's fun it's kind of the brand certainly evolved over time so questions how did you get started with social media marketing um, I did my thesis on Twitter when it had about 2,000 users so very very early days and um, got started in a field where social media really wasn't an industry yet it was just so new and so it's fascinating to see how it's obviously changed in the last seven, eight years, I mean, how the trajectory of social media. So got a very early start and felt it was powerful and it was going to change how we do business and technology and the landscape and all that good stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that it really has. So that's how I got my start in social media. Uh, when I graduated, I have a master's degree in organizational communication and technology from the University of Texas. So when I graduated, I thought I would go get a job except there were no jobs because the industry didn't exist. So it really has been just a fascinating last seven to eight years and in, in sort of um, the entire range of, of social media and the world around it. So um, that's when I just start, start, decided to start my own company, the Marketing Zen Group, and uh, haven't looked back since. So that's kind of how I got started in the field. Um, what's my story en route to 30 under 30? So... Yeah, I can tell you guys a little bit about the 30 under 30. You know, I, I don't know if there's a specific route. You know, everyone who ends up on the Forbes 30 under 30 kind of gets there in their own way. Um, and, you know, for me, obviously, I think when people hit that list, it's because they've already been in the media quite a bit. At least that was true for me. And I'd been writing for Forbes for almost two years. I had my own column with Forbes, um, stuff like that. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's... It's been fascinating to just kind of be a part of the Forbes 30 under 30 community because it very much is a community. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if there's a direct route. If the question is more sort of how do you make that list if you are under 30 and you're looking to get on that list, I think it does help to, one, be good at your craft and make sure that you're sharing your success stories. So, you know, when we, whenever we do have campaigns, whenever we do good work, um, we definitely, I mean, to me, we practice what we preach. So my company... We're very involved in social media, in PR, making sure that we're sharing our own story. And I think that's pretty important. Um, and then just getting in front of the right people in at Forbes helps in terms of they know who you are. And like I said, I built up a relationship over time with various Forbes editors and so forth. Not that I think that directly contributed to being on the list, but I think, of course, if they know your name, that's helpful. Um, Ankur asks, congrats on the Dippin' Dots campaign. Thank you. Tell us about the experience running it and end results. Yeah, the Dippin' Dots campaign has just been a phenomenal experience. So Dippin' Dots is uh, a client of Marketing Zen's, of my companies. And what's been fascinating about 
being, you know, kind of running that campaign was how quickly it picked up steam. So for those who don't know, uh, Press Secretary Sean Spicer had said some um, not so great things about the company and those tweets got dug up uh, by some reporters. And before you know it, the company was trending, the topic was trending, and the company really had to respond. So we helped the company come up with sort of the strategy and did an open letter from the CEO uh, to to Press Secretary Sean Spicer. And that whole campaign really took off. People responded to it. They liked that the messaging was it's very much within the brand voice. It was funny. It was on point. It was um, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, but not offensive. And the idea was that ice cream brings people together. So within about 48 hours of that campaign, we had 1.4 billion reach. And so the equivalent of about 11 Super Bowl ads is what that campaign reached. Um, and it was just it was fantastic in terms of, you know, being able to see that sort of visibility and traction for a client. And a client that does, obviously, you know, is a great company and they make great products. And to be able to take advantage of an opportunity like that, I think, is kind of what social is so much about. Um, with Snapchat's IPO being today, where do you see the future of this company going? Thanks for your question, Vincent. So uh, I actually was on Fox just a little bit ago talking about Snapchat's IPO. I think Snapchat is not looking at Facebook as a competitor. I think people think Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter. I think Snapchat's really looking at Apple as kind of where they want to go. And hence, we're a camera company, um, which really, I was talking about, you know, camera not being what a camera company used to mean in the yesteryear. So camera company not meaning like Polaroid or Kodak, but camera company meaning like technology, you know, content sharing. And I think they've just, they've tried to, uh, simplify it or dumb it down a little too much, but I think that's kind of the bigger picture of where Snapchat is really headed. Um, I think their greatest challenge is going to be expanding their user base because the majority of their users are 25 and under, which makes it very challenging. Uh, they also kind of hit um, mass penetration in that market, so how do you expand that and how do you keep innovating? So I think it's interesting. I think like Snapchat's kind of toughest days are really ahead of it in terms of how they're able to um, justify this IPO. Uh, how do you balance your busy schedule? Um, <laughs> I, you know, for me, work and life are very much one and the same. I don't separate them out. I think it's in, in this digital age, I think it's very hard to say work is nine to five and this is my personal life. For me, it's all integrated. I mean, who I am as a CEO is also very much who I am as a sister and a daughter and, you know, so forth. So, I think for, for me, I think about it in, in that way. And as long as, as, if I don't think about this being work and this being my personal life, then I think it makes things a lot more interesting. And, and I'm doing what I'm passionate about, what I love, and I feel grateful for that. So, uh, Okay, we're back. Sorry, guys, it looked like I paused there for a second. Uh, what are three books you recommend every entrepreneur to read? Uh, three books, top of mind, that I like um, are Blue Ocean Strategy. It's kind of a classic MBA read. It's about how to play in a competitive field. Um, I like Paul Coelho's The Alchemist. It's not a business book, but I think it's a life book, and that's just as useful in business and in life. And I actually re like really like anything by Michael Neal, who also writes I guess of what you would say self-help, but I think a lot of that is applicable to business as well. Um, what's the value of using Facebook or um, Instagram Live? I mean, live video I think is huge, right? More people tune into live videos or watch videos versus any other type of content on the web. I think that alone gives it great, great gravitas. Um, whenever we work with clients and we do live video, you know, on news feeds, it gets three times more play than any other type of content. So all these things I think make a huge difference. Um, what are the key things for pitch deck for money needs to have either for sponsorship or investment? I think the best pitch decks I've seen, and I see a lot of them, are one that have a clear premise um, that are well designed. I do think it makes a difference. I mean, design is just not optional these days, guys. I mean, people are like, oh, this is just our beta version. No, I mean, if, if it's poorly designed, you're not going to get the kind of attention or credibility that you want. It's just not optional these days. So I think a pitch deck does need to look good. I think it needs to be have a very clear promise. Um, it needs to have a very clear understanding of the marketplace. You know, when you see things like 
there's no competitors to this or there's no alternative, that's always a red flag because let's face it, even God has competition. So it's really important to be able to look at these things and say, you know, where, how do we, um, how are, do we really understand the market? Um, Jeffrey asks, if social media success is so much about telling compelling stories, what's the best way to tell stories? Is everything going towards live and video? Um, you know, I, I think video is just a method, right? It's, or it's just a modality to be able to tell stories. And so I think some of the best stories come from, of course, having, you know, the elements of a good story don't change a good plot line, characters, so forth. Um, the arc of a story doesn't change, but I think video makes it so, um, so powerful to be able to convey that story. And I think a lot of it's about choices. I mean, some people will prefer to watch video, the majority do, but there's people that will prefer to read and listen and whatever. That's why you have a rise in podcasting and blogs and why none of this is going away. We're just adding to the ecosystem. Uh, Ankur asks, how, you've done a lot of public speaking. How do you overcome strange fright? How do you develop speaking topics? Yeah, I've been doing public speaking for a long time. I've been keynoting for about seven, eight years now. And I don't know if stage fright was such a big issue for a challenge for me. I had my own challenges, but I don't know if that was one of them. I think because I'd been doing it from a young age, I debated in high school, I did oratory in high school. So I think being able to, to kind of get used to that at an earlier age, being comfortable being on stage or speaking to a live audience certainly helps. Um, and then I think it just takes practice. I think if you gave me a topic I knew nothing about and put me in front of people, I probably would be nervous because I don't know what I'm talking about. But because I talk about things that, you know, I'm in the trenches with marketing, technology, entrepreneurship, it's a lot easier to talk about things I think that you have expertise in. Uh, what are some other entrepreneur communities that you feel are doing well? Um, you know, I think entrepreneur committee, uh, communities are great. I think they're a little overrated, to be honest. I mean, I'm based here in Dallas, and I wouldn't see that Dallas has a super thriving entrepreneurship committee community. Some people may disagree. It's not my necessarily my view of things. I think when it comes to compared to Silicon Valley or New York, we're actually quite behind. But I don't think it makes a difference because I really don't think you're limited to your location to be successful as an entrepreneur. Um, I think if anything, it probably helps to be somewhere that's not as, um, <laughs> I think that's, that's not as crazy sometimes as Silicon Valley in New York because you can focus on what's absolutely imperative and important and you don't kind of get caught up in, I think, that feel, right, or, or, or comparisons or, well, this company's IPOing and this company's doing that. And I think you get to work at your own pace and build something sustainable. So I think that's actually uh, a good thing. So it's a different way to sort of answer that question. So hopefully that, that helps. Um, it's the best piece of advice a mentor has given you. Sorry, there's more questions. All right, guys, happy to answer a few more. What's the best piece of advice a mentor or more has given you that you still live to date? You know, the best piece of advice that I think um, a mentor gave me was that there's abundance in everything. And I think that's really true. I think, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs see as like, if I win, someone has to lose, or if I lose, it means someone else wins. And I just don't think that's true. I think it's so much broader than that. I think it's, there's plenty of opportunities and abundance and clients. There's so much to go around that I think coming from that perspective is certainly helpful. Um, awesome. Sigma asks, we're a college entrepreneurship group and wondering how you could start developing these contacts at places like Forbes all these big outlets without having much credibility. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you want to write a column, and I have a column with Forbes and Inc., and it took a long time to develop those, so it's not something they just hand out pretty freely. Um, I think, you know, one of the ways that helps is certainly to offer writing, um, con a, being a contributor initially. And if you can contribute a piece that's meaningful, that's attractive to their audience, that so their editors like, and that you're driving traffic to, um, I, that's a really good way to build that relationship. And I started contributing pieces long before I had a column with either of those. Um, what's my one piece of advice for balancing school, a job, and trying to start a business? I don't know. I just, I'm not a big balancing person. I feel like you've got to throw yourself into it. <laughs> Balance, I feel, is a little overrated. I think it's hard when you try to keep things in silos rather than just embrace it and say, this is life. Sometimes you're working, you know, at school. Sometimes you're working on the job. Then you're doing your business. I think it all has to come together. 
Yeah, is there room for another social platform? Oh, absolutely. I think there'll always be room for a social media platform in the world. I mean, there. The only thing I can guarantee you is that there probably will be another social media platform. It's just the nature of human beings, technology. We're creative. We're constantly moving forward. So I think there will always be room for more. Um, and I'm excited about that. I think it makes the world a more exciting place. What does younger mean to you when you hear it? Um, young and hungry. And I think that's what it's supposed to mean. So um, that's what younger means to me. And uh, I definitely try to, to live by those principles and stay hungry. And I guess be able to at least always have a young mindset, which is to constantly keep learning and being an editor. And I think that would be sort of my final piece of advice to anybody listening or watching is you know, you've got to really embrace being an editor rather than a perfectionist because when you're an editor you understand progress is more important than perfection so you believe in like you know 2.0 and 3.0 in this constant evolution of things rather than set and done so hopefully that's helpful that's certainly something that's helped me along my entrepreneurial journey uh thanks so much guys for tuning in to this lunch and learn Feel free to leave questions if you have them. I'm happy to come back later and take a look and, and answer more. Thanks for having me. I'm hungry. Bye.